In today's episode, we talk to Dr. Devin Spence-Benson, Associate Professor of Africana and Latin American Studies at the University of Kentucky. She is author of the book, Anti-Racism in Cuba, The Unfinished Revolution, and English editor of the book, Afro-Cubana's History, Thought, and Cultural Practices, a selection of writings by Black Cuban women. Could you please first start by just talking about how you came across this book, your own academic work around Cuba that led up to it? In what moment did the book come into your life and what inspired you to dedicate all the time that it's taken to bring it into the English language and to English speaking audiences? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much, Catherine, for inviting me to have this conversation today and for your attention and all the work you do um, on Cuba and to also elevate so many great voices. And I'm glad to be able to participate in in this. This is not a solely Devin Benson project. It would never have been possible without so many people who have participated, supported, and have been there all along the way. So um, I feel like it's really important to acknowledge that, it, you know, my name be on the book as editor, but there have been a lot of people who've made this happen. First and foremost, obviously, the Cuban editors, Daisy Rubiera Castillo and Ines Maria Martia Tuteri, um, like they are the ones who first both initiated the group Afro Cubanas and then wrote the initial sort of canonical work now of Cuban Black feminism and published it in 2011. So we start there and then, you know, I can t- I'll talk more about sort of how I came to the book, but I do think it's important to say that the Creolizing the Canon series with Roman and Little Phil International is intentionally doing this type of work of translation. Um, I looked them up and so I want to say that they describe themselves as being partnered with the Caribbean Philosophical Association, and that their goal is, quote, to revisit canonical theorists in the humanities and social sciences through the lens of creolization. It offers fresh readings of familiar figures and presents the case for the study of formerly excluded ones. And so literally, this is a series that intentionally wants to engage with the Caribbean. And that means French speaking, Spanish speaking, Dutch speaking, English speaking, and wants to bring readings that we know as Caribbeanist are really important in the Caribbean and in Latin America to English speaking audiences. And that's no easy feat. It requires a ton of work on a lot of people's ends. So when the series editors approached me, um, they I know one of the series editors really well, Neil Roberts. And he said, Devin, do you know any great books in Spanish that should be translated? And immediately I thought of the Afro-Cubana's text. It's something that I had been working to try and get translated before. I'd applied for other translation grants and hadn't received them. So this seemed like a great opportunity because part of the issue with translation is that it costs a lot of money. Like you have to pay a translator and then you have to go through the process of getting all the permissions and getting permission to be able to publish something that's already been published. So I'm very thankful to David Weiner at the uh, Global Affairs Office at the University of Connecticut because he paid for the translation. We're obviously very thankful for the translator, Karina Alma, and I'll say more about that later when we talk about the process. But I do think it's really important to say that it was a really, it was a team effort. So we have both the contributors in Cuba who wrote the book initially But then we have all these people in the United States who said, you know what, this is something worthy of translating. Let's put money, resources, and time behind it. So I guess that doesn't answer your initial question about me and how I came to work on Cuba and to sort of uh, meet Daisy Rubieta and um, Ines Maria Martiatu Teddy. So I can, I'll go back to that a little bit, but I just wanted to put it out there that this is sort of like, it it took a village, right? And I'm really glad to be a part of that village. so that we can have this work with us today. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So I've been going to Cuba since 2003. Um, I did my PhD um, research at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill with Lou Perez. And I was one of those students who came to grad school not knowing what I was going to study. I knew I was going to work on Cuba, but I certainly didn't have a topic. Um, My previous research in undergrad and my undergraduate thesis had been on Guatemala and indigenous communities. Um, So I wasn't sure what I wanted to work on when I came to grad school. Lou took a real risk and like took a chance by letting me into the program sort of topicless. And that meant when I got to graduate school, I just started reading furiously all the new books that were coming out about Cuba in the early 2000s. And a lot of those books were about race in Cuba, right? So Alejandro de la Fuente, um, Frank Garitti, 
um, Melina Papademos, like the books that we sort of know as canonical works, Aisha Finch that were coming out about race in Cuba, um, Ida um, Eiling Held, and Ada Ferrer's book, all these books came out in early 2000. And I'm reading them as a part of my graduate program, and I'm thinking, well, I really want to work on race in Cuba for obvious reasons. I am a black woman from the United States. I'm not a woman of Cuban descent. I am. I tell everybody, I was like, no, I'm just a regular black person from North Carolina. All of my family is descendants of slaves. Like, we're all from here. Um, but that didn't mean that I wasn't interested in diasporic connections. I definitely, when I was reading stories about people of African descent in Cuba, there were things that rang true with my own experience, my family's own experience here in the United States. And because of that, I knew I wanted to work on race and racism and blackness in Cuba, but it was also hard because in some ways people were like, well, what topic hasn't been covered? Um, and so when I started looking for a topic, I initially received a lot of pushback about the idea of working on a post-1959 topic. Um, my advisor was like, do you really want to wade into those waters? He was like, one, the archives are going to be a challenge to get into, to work with, and two, the politics. Like people who write about the revolution always get seeped into this type of politics. But I, the very first paper that I wrote for him that sort of allowed, that gave Lou the idea that I might be able to do this is actually one of the connections I have with Daisy Rubietta. We had read Raita, um, the testimony of a black Cuban woman in the 20th century, which is the testimonial, a memoir that Daisy did in collaboration with her mother um, about her mother's life. And I had written a response paper, about four to five pages about that essay. And I was talking about colorism and the choices that people might make to marry someone who was white in order to adelantar la raza, which is what they would say in Cuba, advance the race. But in the United States also happened as well. Um, and so I think I wrote this essay and I was like, for me, it's not about politics. It's about black people's lives, the choices that they make, the ways that they resist, the way that they survive. And I think I wrote that essay and he was like, you know, maybe you are the person who could do a topic on Post 59 without getting so pulled in. And so that sort of started, I went to um, Cuba to do research and I've been going to Cuba since 2003. I usually make one to two trips a year. The longest period that I was there was for eight months. And I went to go um, both do my graduate school field work for my dissertation, but also because I was leading UNC Chapel Hill's study abroad program. At that time, Chapel Hill was one of the few places that led a full study abroad program. The program was six months, it was a full semester. It was during the Bush years. So you had to be on the ground for that amount of time to get students in Cuba. And so part of what I was doing when I was there was doing my own research, but I was also supposed to bring in um, speakers for my students to inter interact with. So I met Daisy Rubietta um, through introductions from other, from people, archivists and people that I met in the library, because I was working in the National Library and the National Archive. I met her in the fall of 2006. And from there, we sort of started conversations. I was like, well, this is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in thinking about how black Cubans experienced the first couple of years of the revolution. Who do you think I should talk to? She starts telling me other scholars that I should talk to, things that I should read, you know, the way that it is where people are mentoring someone who's young, because I was just a graduate student in my, you know, sort of mid 20s. Um, and so she's talking to me a lot. And then because we sort of started forming um, a relationship, when my students arrived, because I got there before they did, when they arrived in January, I was like, I really want you to come talk to my students. And she came. And plus, of course, I'd always been a big fan. Like, this is sort of like one of those moments where you're meeting like your, you know, your, your Shiro, your, your girl crush. I'm like, you wrote Raita? Oh, my goodness. Like, that's one of my favorite books. Um, so I was like, well, I've, my students will have read Raita. I would like for you to come speak with them. And so she came and gave this fabulous lecture to my students about obviously black women's experiences and the process of writing Raita and the work that she had done, but also just about the current economic situation in Cuba, which was really challenging and continues to still be, even though 2007 was, you know, however many seven years after the official end of the special period and the economic collapse that had happened following the fall of the Soviet Union, she continued to talk about how that was affecting all Cubans, but especially Black women. The ways that Black women were often assumed to be prostitutes, um, not let into hotels, um, the types of discrimination that they faced any time that they were sort of interacting with foreigners. She was like, you know, if I go walking with one of your students right now, like the kinds of things that will happen. So we talked a lot about that. Um, and that sort of just began a long collaboration process. This, the other thing that came out of that is because I was in Cuba for so long, Daisy invited me to attend 
the, the meetings of the working group um, Afro-Cubanas. So Afro-Cubanas actually starts as a community project, as a gathering of intellectuals, activists, women in their homes, um, meeting Black women meeting with each other and saying, look, we want to do something about the negative stereotypes that affect that are seen about black women in Cuba. We wanna offer a counter discourse. We wanna put something else out there. And so they started having these meetings and she invited me to come to the meetings. A sort of interesting aside is if you know the, um, the anthropologist Maya Berry, who's at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, I met Maya Berry for the first time at an Afro-Cubana working group meeting in Havana rather than in the United States, because she was someone else who was um, asked, as a, even as a foreigner, to sort of come and participate in the meetings. So I was mostly just listening, sort of taking notes, listening to the types of activism, the ways that they wanted to work in communities. They were like, it's really important for us to work with young girls, to get girls to understand that being black is beautiful. Or talking about how they wanted to think about how do we get more black women on TV? Or thinking about how is it that we can actually go about changing the curriculum? And ultimately they decided that they needed to write something, right? That if we're gonna offer a counter discourse to the grand narrative of Cuban history that is so often told about and by white men, white Cuban men, but still white men, then the point was that we need to write something ourselves. And what they ended up doing was writing the collection Afro-Cubanas. So they published the initial book Afro-Cubanas in 2011, um, and including a number of contributors. One of the things that's most important, and I'll say this all the time, is that the book is has a large scope, both in time period. So it's divided into three sections, history, um, thought, and cultural practices. But then it's also a scope across the island. So it has women from Havana to Santiago to Sin Fuegos to, um, to just all the, to different places in Oriente. So they published the initial book, right? So the initial book comes out and as soon as Daisy gives me a copy, because the way books releases happen in Cuba is they're often either released at the um, International Book Fair in January and February, or maybe they'll come out at a, another time, but books tend to run out very quickly. The economic situation means that presses don't often have a lot of paper, aren't able to actually print a lot of copies. So the initial run of Afro-Cubanas was 5,000 copies that's presented at the book fair. I don't get to Cuba until 2012. So the book has already come out and Daisy's like, I saved you two copies. Here you go. And inside she's like, to my sister in the battle against racism. Because by this point, we've known each other for over six years. And so that became, and as soon as I start reading it, I was like, this is something that has to be in English. And that sort of began this long process of thinking about how do we get to a translation? Um, I since I've been at Davidson, I taught two new. I taught a new course called Afro-Cubana Feminisms, where we dove deep into um, different Black women's political and sort of activist thought in Cuba. So it focused on four different women. But I always start the semester by saying, "Okay, I want us to read the introduction, the prologue to Afro-Cubanas." And the first two times that I taught the class, I actually went through and translated the introduction and the prologue myself and within collaboration with one of my students because I was like, we need to be able to read this. And so for the non-Spanish speakers in the class, how do we have access to something that's so important? You can't teach a book, you can't teach a class called Black Women's Feminisms in Cuba and not actually read Afro-Cubanas. And I think that was sort of what planted the idea. And from there, like I said, with all the people who were involved, as soon as I had the opportunity, I was like, this is the book that we should translate. Yeah, I mean, like, it was such an honor to get to meet so many of the contributors. So, of course, a part of doing the translation meant that I had to get permission from all of the contributors to be able to use their essay. So on one hand, there were some people that, because I'm working with Daisy, Daisy and I are doing this together. Daisy's like, okay, I can send emails. There's some people who will immediately email back their permission. And there are other people who, because it had been, like you said, almost 10 years, we didn't have email accesses, addresses for, we didn't have Facebook contacts for. And so I literally spent time traveling across the island <laughs> to get permission. And that was incredible because that way I got to meet people who I had met before. 
So, um, so one of the things is, like I said, because it's divided into three sections, it really is an interdisciplinary book, which is important for me as someone who sits in as, you know, an Africana studies faculty member, as a Latin American studies faculty member, both of those disciplines are inherently interdisciplinary. And this book does that in incredible ways. It's sort of a model for what that looks like. So it has a section on history where you're going, where you can read about some of the best historians, some of the blessed black women historians in Cuba. Um, Digna Castaneda Fuertes, who's, who has one of the opening essays, exactly, is like the historian, <laughs> like one of the historians of slavery and black women in Cuba. And so she was someone who I had met before while I was doing my research, but she was also someone who I was able to see in the last year of her life when I went by her house to get her permission for after Cubanas to be published in English. Um, so like you've got sort of like founders of the field, like Digna, and then you also have people who are really young and really new um, there are a lot of people in the book who like are just activists, right? So people who came to the meetings who told Daisy and um, Lalita, Ines Maria Marti Atuteri, who I also had the pleasure of working with and meeting, um, they told them their stories and they were like, well, I want you to write that essay. Um, so then what you get in the other sections are sort of also this, so for gender, right? You're going to have all these great essays like Norma Guillard, who worked at Cinesex, um, the Center um, for Studies of Sexuality and Against Homophobia in Cuba, has a great essay about being Black and queer and what sexuality means in Afro-Cubanas. You also have people who are writing essays about religion, right? So one of the essays that's in there is about um, what does it mean to be a woman and a practitioner in Regla de Osha, right? That's actually one of the essays that Daisy wrote. So like that essay is in there. And then we have essays about theater, like Fatima Patterson from Santiago has an incredible essay about like what her black women's theater group and what does it mean to do a black theater group in Santiago. And I met her for the first time ever when I was getting her signature, really right after she had done a play for the Fiesta del Fuego, right? So I'm down there for the Caribbean Festival in Santiago over the summer and tw in 2018. And I go to one of her openings just so I can pull out a sheet of paper and say hi Fatima it's great to meet you the play was incredible can you sign this piece of paper uh, and so like that was again another moment of someone who I had heard about but hadn't had an opportunity to meet um, so there are a number of other women and I'm thinking about um, Carmen's essay Carmen let me get her last name um, Carmen Gonzalez yeah Carmen Gonzalez Chancon the essay on hair is actually one of my all-time favorite essays in the book. And when I read her, that essay about her describing the different ways that Black women navigate having Black hair in Cuba and in her life is incredible. Um, so all of these, like meeting some of these authors, but also reading these different essays. So knowing that you have things about gender and sexuality, about history, about theater, about cultural practices, about everyday life, like hair and interracial dating and being a mixed race woman. There's an essay in there about that. Each one of those is so powerful and so important. Um, and I think the other thing that's really like that struck me about meeting so many of the contributors was, like I said, they vary in sort of geographic region. People live all over Cuba. They vary in like the sort of like time that they spend in the academic field. So you've got really young women versus women like Georgina Herrera, who like a lot of people thought of as like the member of honor of Afro-Cubanas, the group, because she was like an elder and seen as an elder in that space because um, she'd been in the fight for so long, is that you sort of see a cross-generational way of Black women coming together to offer this counter discourse. And that feels like that's really important and very unique about this book as well. At some point it starts feeling like, it starts feeling surreal. Like I said, when you meet people who you have read their work, they've been foundational to your ways of thinking, and then you're sitting in their house having coffee and they're treating you like you're just an everyday person, like like we're equals. And I'm like, no, Daisy, we're nowhere near equals. <laughs> like, no, Lalita, we're like, that's not, you all are like my mentors, exactly. 
Um, so that has been such an important part of this journey. And I think you asked me initially about my own research, and part of this has always intertwined. Um, and I, I will be the biggest critic of my own work, right? So my book, Anti-Racism in Cuba, The Unfinished Revolution, looks at the first three years of the Cuban Revolution and sort of dives in into the steps and the missteps that the revolutionary government takes to eliminate discrimination. And part of that story is also thinking about how Black Cubans respond to that. So, and because I'm a historian, I'm using a lot of newspaper articles, written text, and I'm looking to talk about, okay, well, Black Cubans wrote this letter to the editor to say that they disagreed with this policy, or Black Cubans wrote this ed letter to the editor to say, yes, we agree with that policy, now we want to see it actually enacted. And so the book really talks about the different ways that the revolutionary government thinks it solves for racism because of the fact that they are integrating tangible spaces, um, beaches, uh, public schools, employment, even as black humans are saying, yes, but I'm still experiencing discrimination because you haven't gotten rid of the taboo that's around blackness. So I write this whole book and the whole time I'm doing the research for the book, I'm constantly being surrounded by these revolutionary, brilliant, radical Afro-Cubanas. And yet if you look at my book, you would probably say there are actually not that many black women in it. And that was tragic for me because of the ways that the sources led me to write a particular narrative that focused on men like Juan Rene um, Bentancor and Carlos Moore and um, Walterio Carbonell, that when I'm writing about the black activists that are pushing in the 1960s, I didn't find as many of the types of sources that historians use, especially young historians in their first book. No one else has to make this mistake, by the way. I think we've liberated ourselves from that. Um, but that's how I felt, the types of sources that I could use to write that narrative. So what does it mean to write a book that has mostly male characters when the fertile ground for your ideas is brilliant black women? And that's how the epilogue to my book sort of came about because through the process of doing my research, I, like I've already described how I became close with Daisy Rubietta. We presented at a conference together about what does it mean to use memoirs and testimonials to do historical research because I was like, more people should be pulling on things like Reita to write history rather than newspapers and government documents and so on and so forth. And so we wrote an essay about that um, together and we presented it at a conference in Canada. We, um, she introduced me to Ines Maria Matiatu Teddy, Lalita, as well as Georgina Herrera. And I spent countless hours doing oral histories with both of those women because I wanted to understand what their lives were like in the 1960s and the 1970s with the thought that even if I don't have documents, I can have oral histories from people who lived as young black women during these early years of the revolution. So one of the things that um, Lalita and I talked a lot about was her relationship with Sara Gomez, the black Cuban filmmaker, the first black Cuban filmmaker who worked at ICAIC, the Cuban National Film Institute. And um, Lalita and Sara were really close friends. And so she talks to me about the things that Gomez experiences at working at ICAIC, what, why she wrote um, and made many of the documentaries that she made, how she sort of both foregrounded blackness and feminism and just asked really critical questions. And she's always telling me, she's like, Devin, Sara Gomez wasn't a counter-revolutionary. She's like, all she ever wanted was to perfect the revolution. All she ever wanted was for it actually to reach the people that it said it was going to reach. And those are the people that she highlights in the 14 some documentaries that are mostly until recently unknown, as well as, as in De Siete Manera, the feature film that's a little bit more known. So I'm doing these interviews. I'm talking a lot with Georgina Herrera, and she is describing to me what does it mean to be one of the young people hanging out in the National Library in the late in the 60s and 70s as a part of Ediciones del Puente, which was an independent press that published that was a group of people that included a number of gay and queer people, that included a number of black people, that included just a lot of young people, people who were interested in using the revolution as a radical space for intellectual thought. And I'm like, okay, I was like, why aren't all these people in my first book? You see glimpses of them in the epilogue where I start talking about the people who stay in Cuba and persist in thinking about anti-racism, even after the government has said that we've eliminated discrimination and we don't have to talk about this anymore. I make the argument that even when the government lets go of this battle, that you have women like Georgina Herrera, Ines Maria Martiatu Teddy, Daisy Rubietta in Santiago, but Sara Gomez still fighting the battles in Cuba, 
right? So they don't leave and go into exile like some black men or even other people do. They stay in Cuba and they still continue to fight for anti-racism. But I also link them to the new anti-racist movement or the resurgence of the anti-racist movement that happens in the 1990s after the special period. So after the special period, as people start talking about, quote unquote, the return of racism, I make the argument in my book that it never really went away, but that it sort of goes underground, which is that they start saying that the new economic changes mean that racism is much more in people's face. Then I'm like, it makes complete sense that there would be black women like the Afro-Cubanas group who are leading that fight because they've been doing it since the 60s. So I trace that arc in the epilogue of my book through the relationships that I built, built with these women while I was in Havana doing my research because I just felt like it didn't work for their voices not to be in the book given that they were the ones who were supporting me, you know, working with me in the archive, telling me different people that I should interview. So now my second project, which is actually about black consciousness in Cuba, um, 1968 to 1978, this is actually going to be a book that prioritizes black women's voices and thinks about the types of ways that black women intellectuals actually continue to do this work in the late 60s and 70s. Because we actually have a lot more sources for black women, written sources, as well as oral history sources um, from black women in that time period. I, I mean, I think I was just finishing up to say like how important it was to sort of do my research in the cradle of this sort of um, black feminist movement that was happening in Cuba in the in the 2000s and that those relationships not only allowed me to further my own research they were but they were collaborative and so I think that collaboration continued and it was a natural sort of next step to think about doing the translation for Afro-Cubanas. Yeah great. Because um, it was a way of recognizing and giving back to black women who'd given me so much which is very much a tradition of black feminism, right? For black women to lift up younger black women and then for us to continue to support and recognize our mentors and our sort of advisors. I really wanted to ask you part about the translation as well and this process of mm -hmm. translation, that translating these diverse voices of black Cuban women that are mm -hmm. in the Afro-Cubanist book, but all these different regions, as you're saying, different perspectives, mm -hmm. dis different disciplines, poets, historians, activists. Mm -hmm. What was the journey of translating these voices? Yeah. And so to begin, I have to give all the credit here to Karina Alma. Um, she is an incredible scholar and translator and someone that I was very lucky to get the opportunity to work with. So I mentioned the series editors before, so that because um, the series editors actually recommended that I work with Karina Alma to do the translation. Um, they had worked with her before and they were really excited about that. And so I was like, sure, let's do that. Karina is a professor at um, UCLA and Chicano and Chicano Studies Department. And she um, was born in El Salvador, but then grew up in Los Angeles. And so she comes to the project not with not with a lot of experience on the ground as field work in Cuba, but with a lot of experience translating and working in the field of an interdisciplinary field like Chicano Chicana studies. And so she brought with that so much um, grace and eloquence and just brilliance to the project. That didn't mean that translating was easy. Translating was still very much a challenge for all the reasons that you said, right? Geographic specificity, but there's also time period specificity, which is something that I hadn't talked about yet. So on one hand, many of the contributors to the, S to the book are um, people that we can talk to today and who are scholars in Cuba or in the Cuban diaspora somewhere. But they're also, especially in the history section, a, at least five to seven essays that are taken from 19th century black feminists. So they re, they're reprinting essays from 19th century and early 20th century black feminists because they want to show the long trajectory of black feminist thought, that black women had been fighting against racism and against sexism and for equality since the, you know, the 1880s in the 1890s. So we have essays in here by Consuelo Serra, Rafael Serra's daughter. Rafael Serra was a close companion and friend and interlocker with Jose Marti. Um, we have essays in there from other women through who, again, like I said, late 19th century and early 20th century. That meant that some of the words in those essays were actually quite challenging to translate because none of us 
no 19th century Cuban words in some ways. Like sometimes they would be so specific that that was something that we often had to look up. So I remember there was a moment where it talked about um, the Negro Ora, Oras Negras. And I was, and so of course, initially, Karina and I translated that as Black Hour, but then you're sort of reading it and it's like that's not what it, there's no way that context works in the context of the paragraph and it turns out that they're actually talking about um freed black women and it was one of the words that had been used to talk about freed black women at that particular time another example would probably be that when we were in um, looking at an essay about santiago and they were talking about a word that we were trying to figure out how to translate as lean to or porch, right? Because the word is trying to describe the space outside of a house where someone might sell goods. I didn't know this word. I am not an early 20th century Santiago specialist. I reached out to some people who might know this word. And I was like, do you know this word from colonial documents, late 19th century, early 20th century? And we start Googling pictures to see where the word is. Like, and we're like, okay, what does this mean? We're like, and how is it that we're going to try and figure out how to describe it in English? Because the direct translation would be like lean to. The lean to doesn't give you a sense of the market space, the interaction, the, the, what that space meant for sort of the front of the house space in a Santiago house at that moment. So we, there's a long meaty footnote trying to describe that. Um, probably the other place that you really see that we had lots of conversations about translation were spaces where we were talking about culture and body and physical characteristics. Because so many physical characteristics, like I may be able to describe them to you in a paragraph, but if I'm trying to translate a word, it's like the word pasas, you know, means raisins in Spanish, but is often used to describe kinky or nappy hair in a negative way. Yet in that Pelos essay, you see the author using that word both as a way of reclaiming it and pushing back against the negativity. Do we leave it as pasas? and put a meaty footnote that says, this is seen as raisins, but also negative? Or do we translate it to kinky or nappy, knowing that those words also mean something slightly different? And, and so I think those were the kinds of things that we really worked through. Again, of course, skin color, right? Like I worked through that in my first book. Like if you're trying to translate skin color, if you're trying to, like they're the obvious ones, like negra is black and mulato is mulato, but then there's habao and there's trigueño and there's like the list goes on and on. So how do we translate skin colors? Um, so that became something where we were both trying to, we put in footnotes in the translation, like our own editor's notes. Um, and translator notes that tried to give more context when there was a word that we were trying to understand. Um, and sometimes we left some words in Spanish, um, but for the most part, we tried to translate everything and, you know, did the best job that we could, knowing that especially um, there are words that will never translate easily into English, especially when you're talking about skin color, hair type, physical features. And in the end, on one hand, you, I mean, and I can just put this out here. This is like my understanding of race in Cuba is that it's not as different from race in the United States as we think it is, right? That we're still talking about a place that has a long legacy of slavery and colonialism, that for the most part, people of African descent still face much more challenging life circumstances, even for all the work that the revolution has done. And the revolution has even the playing field in Cuba in a way that we have not seen in the US and we have not seen in Brazil and we have not seen in most former slave and uh, colonial spaces. And yet we still see that if you are a person of visible African descent, that your life chances and opportunities really do look different. That mean, and then for, I think the other thing is like, and other scholars have said this too, is that when you're in Cuba, like the categories, even on the census, aren't as um, expansive as in some other Latin American countries. And that for the most part, there are moments when you can just see Negro and Mulato as being the same thing, right? That you have people who are of African descent and people who are considered white and that you can see real differences there. So when I wrote my first book, and I brought the same mentality to this as well, because I would say, I'm sorry, that the other side of the coin is the reason that it's not as different is in the United States, we like to talk about a rug drop rule and black and white as if we don't have a variety of racial mixing. 
both of the same type that happened in Cuba, which is forced and physical violence and straight up rape, rape um, racial mixing, but that we also have other types of racial mixing, that we have that same history in the United States, even as maybe our census and government documents don't represent that, we know that people's lived experiences do. So I always tell people, I was like, I grew up as a black southerner. I was like, to be called a variety of names based on being a black southerner, based on the skin tone that I have, is not strange to me. I was called high yellow. I was called red. I was called a variety of, like, you know, you're called different colors because of just growing up in the South. We have words for it, too. I spent time in Louisiana when I worked at Louisiana State University. Louisiana has a full range of words for a variety of different skin colors. There are places in the United States that are like that as well. And because of that, I wanted to be able to say, I brought in some of that knowledge when I was thinking about translations. So I was like, okay, how would I translate something like Redbone, which I was called all the time as a kid, to Spanish? And when I start talking to Spanish speakers, they're like, well, that must be like Havao. And I was like, well, see, so we do have words that are in common that we could use, right? When we talk about someone being high yellow, like what words will we be using in the same space? And so I think what we tried to do was stay as close to the Cuban context as we could, but also bringing in thinking about words that we have in the English vocabulary, at least in the United States, that also represent racial mixture of a variety of skin tones. You touched on it earlier, but I would like to just ask you again to talk about or to talk a little more about um, what you feel, what this book adds to the scholarship around Cuba that's available in the English language and what significant gaps that it fills. Yeah. I mean, this is so important because ultimately I will still start with the the gaps in the scholarship of the book filled in the Spanish language historiography as well, right? So when we're, you know, when you're in Cuba and you're reading books about Cuba and the history of Cuba and um, society and culture in Cuba, it is very rare to see a book that emphasizes or focuses in on Black women. Um, one of the things that I always say is that this is the first book in Cuba to use the word Afro-Cubana in the title. Like that is not something that you see every day. There continues to be, um, it's much more accepted now to use words like Afro-Cuban in Cuba. But even 10 years ago when this book was coming out, that was a word that was very controversial because many Cubans would say, well, we're all Afro-Cuban. We all are, you know, the person who isn't descendant of Congo is descendant of um, Karabali, right? Like everybody has African descent. Why are you trying to pull that out? Like that's such an American or North American or U.S. thing to do. And yet many scholars of color and black scholars in Cuba were always like, no, but the black experience is important. We have to use words like negro. We have to use words like Afro-Cubano. Like we have to find words or gente de color or something, right? We have to use some word to talk about our experiences. But even when that was happening, it was very rare to see a book that said, okay, well, let's now talk about the intersected experiences of black women, right? And so I think that that book, the book Afro-Cubanos initially filled a huge gap in the Cuban scholarship Right. So I think we have to start there. It initially filled a huge gap in the Spanish language scholarship that didn't have make spaces for black women. And so then when you think about what gets translated into English, what gets brought over into the United States, what do scholars in the United States write about? Even scholars who write about race, myself and my book included, tend to not focus on black women's voices. Because what we know about silences in the archive, if we're gonna quote Michelle Trio, the Haitian intellectual who wrote that incredible book, is that we know that silences in the archives happen at multiple levels, and they certainly happen at every level for black women from the 19th century forward. So then even in the United States, when we have scholarship about Cuba, it is very rare to see a book that focuses 100% about black women. There's very, there certainly isn't a book that prioritizes black women's voices themselves. So this book becomes sort of a canonical work because not only is it a book about black women, but it is a book written by black Cuban women. Right. So they are literally telling their own stories and inserting that and saying, this is how we want to be understood. And I do think in some ways that's the reason the collection is so powerful, because then it comes from a variety of different angles that you're not getting just one person's perspective, but you're getting 30 some contributors perspectives. 
Um, so I do think that the, and then the, again, like when I, when I'm trying to teach a class, like there are a number of classes now about global feminisms, right? There are classes about non-Western feminism. There are classes about these kinds of things, but even in those classes, how often do you get a book about black women? And then how often do you get a book about black women who don't speak English, mainly because I said the politics of translation are really important. When I think about the texts that I can teach in my Cuban Revolution class, my intro to Latin American studies class, and any of my just sort of regular Latin American history classes, why is it that so often the things that are translated are men's voices? Jose Marti, of course, is translated. Nicolas Guillén, of course, is translated. There's so many people who are translated, but the choice of what to translate into English has always has been and continues to be one that's about politics and power. So when I was approached to say, what book do you want to see translated in Spanish? The first thing I thought of is what book is the least likely to be translated in any other space? And that would be a book about and by Black Cuban women. Are there, do you have hopes that this book will go into like continuing on this topic of the politics of translation and translated works being a reflection of politics and power? Do you have hope that it hopes that it may go into further languages? I mean, I think that would be really incredible. I think that would, I mean, one of the things that we already know is Afro Cubanas is well known in other Spanish speaking countries, right? So when we think about the movement for women of African descent that's been happening throughout Latin America, the Afro Cubanas group and, and the contributors who participated in Afro Cubanas already have hemispheric connections. They have connections with Black women in Colombia, they have connections with Black women in Brazil, they have connections with black women. And like, so they're publishing in books in those countries. Those black women are publishing in books in Cuba, right? There is already this collaboration that's happening. What had not happened, I don't think, is that it hadn't really crossed into another language. It hadn't crossed into English. So how important would it be to have Afro-Cubanas translated into French or to have Afro-Cubanas translated into any other language so that other people can continue to read it? I do think that people are having real conversations about global feminisms and global black feminisms. And in order to have those conversations, we do need to be able to understand and read each other, um, each other's work. Yeah, and you think about also black feminists in the Caribbean that because of the whole history of colonization, you have so many regional experiences together, but so divided by language based on the colonizing countries' exactly. languages, you know, imposed languages from through colonization. Um, I had, there's so much more I could ask you, but I also want to honor your time. And um, the last question that I had already prepared that I would love to hear you talk about is just your selection of the cover art mm -hmm. in the amazing work of Black Cuban visual artist Belki Sayon and, and, um, and how you selected the cover art and how the process of choosing her, but also dealing with her estate and, you know, that it's a, important piece of this work as well, right? Yes. Um, and so in some ways, this is not something that I selected at all. Um, the, the cover art for the initial book, my understanding is that that's something that Ines Maria Martiatu Teddy, that she was in conversation with um, the Belki Sinan estate, and that's how they got the initial work to be on, right? The initial book, that they got this piece through um, Lalita's connections. So then when we decided that we were going to do an English translation and we started thinking about cover art for the English translation, I have to say the press was kind to put up with my, um, we should just call them demand. <laughs> because I do, they initially were like, well, we're going to use, you know, some other cover art. And they sent me a couple of initial mock-ups and I was like, nope. And they were like, well, you know, the art that's on there is an African-American woman artist. Because I was like, I really want something that's by a black woman. And I was like, I recognize that she is an important African-American woman artist. I was like, but the book should have a Cuban black woman artist on it because that's what it had initially. And they were like, well, can you get permission for that? And I was like, well, no, nah, I didn't say I knew if I could do that, but I, I have a plan. Let's, let's start like trying to execute the plan. So I started talking with Daisy and Daisy reaches out to them, but she doesn't have contact information for 
um, the Belki Sanana estate and didn't know anyone in the family. So I'm sitting there sort of like racking my brain. Like we had reached, you know, we had sent some emails, we had made some phone calls, but we hadn't really gotten any response. And I know um, Elio Rodriguez, who is a well-known um, black Cuban artist who lives outside of Cuba. So I had met him when I was at Harvard at the Hutchinson Center doing um, a fellowship when I was finishing up my first book. And Elio was in residence there and he had, you know, in the Hutchins Gallery that's right next to the Hutchins Center, um, formerly known as the Du Bois Center at Harvard, he's got this huge spread and it's like all of his artwork and Elio becomes a good friend of ours. So I was just like, and mind you, I have to admit, I'm also not well known. Like, I don't know a lot of artists. <laughs> the, the, the artists that I know, I could probably count on one hand because like, I'm just, that, that's, my husband is really into art and like, he helps me out a lot because I don't, and there are lots of things I don't understand and art is one of them. But I did know Elio and I was like, maybe I can write Elio and be like, Elio, do you have any contacts like that we might know of somebody who might know, right? Because you're sort of using it Cuban style. Like, do you know anybody who might know somebody who can get us in touch with somebody at the Belkis and Honest State who'll let us use this piece of art? Elio writes me back. This is on Facebook Messenger. The family's staying at my house right now. Let me see if I can get you on the phone with them. I was like, what? <laughs> so it was just in some ways, it was a lot of luck and happenstance um, that we were able to start conversation with um, the estate because we knew we wanted, I wanted the book to, I wanted the English translation to be as true to the Spanish version as possible, but I also wanted it to continue to celebrate black women. And so I just thought black Cuban women. So I thought it was so important for that same piece of art to be on the cover. Um, but then we ran into actually like, you know, you'll notice that the cover looks a little different. All the books in the Creolize and the Canon series had this, they had the same look. They all look like the book and then they have a banner and then they have artwork in the banner, right? So they all look like this. And so then the next step with production was to say, well, Devin, we can't make it look just like the first book because we have to have it look like all the other books in the series. And I was like, well, then now what do we do? And the Belki Sanama state had already told us that we could not crop change the image in any way. So I was like, I still have to use the full image, but you're telling me I have to make it smaller. So this was actually one of those moments where I have a brilliant son. My son, Cameron Kadouncy, was hearing me sort of like try and figure this out. And I was like, can you find a way? And his dad would like, my husband was like, well, maybe you can do it sort of like a repeating banner. And my son gets on his iPhone because, you know, high schoolers can do that and designs this cover. And then once we have the cover design, I send it to Daisy. What do you think? She's like, I love it. Your son is an incredible designer. And then I send it to... Um, and then we sent it to the press and they were like, it fits the specs of what we need to fit for the series. I sent it to the Belkis and Nana State to make sure they were okay with the fact that we had, you know, shrunk. We didn't change crop. We kept the full image, but it was smaller. And they said they were okay with it. And in which case we were able to sort of continue the legacy of doing the work that Afro-Cubanas had done, which is drawing attention to really incredible Black Cuban women's voices. I guess my last question would just be how you dream this book will be taught how you dream this book will be used, um, how you plan to continue teaching this work yourself. Mm -hmm. Just what are your dreams for this book? Yeah. I mean, I really, when, you know, when you, when you think about a book and you propose something to a press, you have to tell them all the places that it might go, right? Because they need to know that the book will sell and do well. And I was like, this could be taught in any class. Like, I can see a book like this being taught in a Latin American history or society or culture class. So, like, then we've got Latin anthropology and history and poli-sci. I could see, and so just in the general classes, but I can also see a book like this really making a big impact in the field of gender and sexuality studies, right? So, if, like, if you have a gender gender and sexuality studies, women's studies departments, they, those are the classes where they're teaching, they're beginning to teach, right? Like it's becoming a more and more regular thing to have a global feminisms or a black feminisms class in those departments. And I think it's really important for us to reach outside of just things in the English language. And you can do that here in this book because the book has been translated into English. So you're getting to have Spanish speaking voices inside. I see, I can definitely see the book making a huge impact into Africana studies departments because because again, Africana studies departments also have tended to be heavily English language oriented. That has changed a lot, I would say, in probably the past five to 10 years, where you see so many more black studies departments or Africana studies departments having someone who does Afro-Latin America 
or who does blacks in Europe or who does blacks outside of just the United States and Africa, which had been traditionally where you saw most of black studies departments having scholars from an English speaking Caribbean. So I think this really allows for black studies to really grow and flourish in a way where you finally see how so many of the political thought that is foundational to black studies and to feminist thought crosses borders and language borders and boundaries. So I think those are the kinds of places that I can see the book go. I'm excited for my family to read the book. Like the book is also, while the book is has essays that are of intense and um, challenging academic language, it also has essays that are just regular people's language because that's the point of writing an interdisciplinary radical piece of scholarship is that you want to make it accessible to everybody on a variety of levels. So I think there are a lot of people who can just read the essays in the book and be like, that's like my experience. I've struggled with my hair or I've been in an interracial relationship or I've been in this situation where a being at work and being put down by a white colleague because of something I believe because of something my family does because I'm black. Like, I think there are going to be, there are lots of places that the book can go. All of that is going to be dependent, though, on us getting good sales so that we can move to the paperback version quite quickly, <laughs> because right now the book is quite expensive. Oh, this it's is only the reason that we, cover it's right now. Hard, it's, it's hardcover and electronic copy. So you can get an affordable electronic copy. So I recommend the electronic copy. The hardcover, like many academic books when they first come out, is pricey. We currently have a 40% off coupon, Afro-Cubana's 40, like no space, just Afro-Cubana's 40. You use that on the press page, you can get 40% off. And so that's one of the ways that we, I, I intentionally wanted to make the, um, the hardcover more accessible. But I do think that, you know, the way academic publishing works in the United States is we do, because it's connected to profit and capitalism, is that we do still have to work really hard to get lots of libraries to buy the book so we can get through our hard copy requirements and then move hopefully to a really easily and accessible paperback copy that I think will be taught even more and more. But thank goodness for electronic books, right? I'm going to order mine today. And I'm just so thankful, Dr. Devin Spence Benson, for this conversation, for this work, for, your, for all of your contributions through your own work. Thank you so much. I mean, it is it was truly an honor to get to work with so many brilliant black women and to continue to work with so many brilliant black women to really make a difference and to, like I said, offer this counter discourse to the negative stereotypes about black women. Black women's voices matter. Black Cubans women's voices matter. And it's time that we sort of start taking that into account. This interview was conducted and recorded by Catherine Murphy on July 28th of 2020. Stay tuned for future episodes of the Maestra podcast.